All right, everyone. Well, today I am very excited about this conversation that uh, I'm about to have, and mainly because this is something that is very personal to me. I know I've made mention in maybe some of our past episodes about my personal dealings with occipital neuralgia, having to deal with lots of headaches. And although this may be a little bit off the beaten path from our usual conversations around nutrition and exercise, I just felt like this was a topic that was too relevant not to cover. And also selfishly, I wanted to invite the gentleman on who I really credit for a lot of the healing that's been gone going on in my head over the course of the last several months. Um, so I have with me today, Gustav Grunso, and please let me know again, did I pronounce that correctly or that's just yep. so, so perfect, <laughs> perfect, perfect. <laughs> well, well, listen, Gustav, I mean, what I wanted to do is just start off first by just saying thank you. I just wanted to thank you because as the, the story goes, um, you know, I myself have been battling with occipital neuralgia for years. Uh, I am somebody who grew up in a family full of people who were constantly dealing with headaches, migraines of all different sorts. And that for me progressed all the way through adulthood. And what I recognized was over time, as I started to improve certain areas of my life, first the nutrition, the headaches got better. You know, then I'd improve some other aspect of the way that I was exercising and the headaches would get better. But it was probably about four or five years ago that I had this sudden onslaught of headaches, unlike the types that I've ever had before. Instead of having the, the typical migraine headache where it would just pulsate in the front of my head, now all of a sudden I'm feeling this excruciating pain in the back of my head and it's radiating all the way over the top. And the, the more deeply I looked into it, you know, the, with the term that kept coming up were cluster headaches. I'm experiencing these cluster headaches. And so I saw a chiropractor that specialized in upper cervical and it helped. But then over time, it didn't help so much. So I saw another chiropractor and they got a little bit better for a while. But no matter what I tried, uh, these headaches just continued to manifest themselves and get worse and worse and worse until as uh, as early as about last year, I was going through every single week, every six to eight days, having one of these debilitating headaches until one day I was actually sitting down with one, just starting to recover and started doing some research. And that's when I came upon you and you had started to demonstrate on your YouTube videos, some techniques that were related to trigger points and massage. And so literally sitting in the chair back behind me, I had my eyes closed and I'm listening and I'm doing some of these techniques and suddenly I'm feeling the headache dissipate. And I turned to my wife, I go, you will not believe this for all the suffering that I've been dealing with the past couple of days with this, I'm actually feeling better for the first time. And so what I'd like to do is first, um, Introduce yourself to everybody. I'd, I'd love for them to hear your background, your story about how you arrived where you are now, teaching this to people and, and what your plans are for this for the future. Yeah. So um, as you might tell from my accent, I'm not uh, an American. I'm not from the US. I'm from Denmark, from, uh, from Copenhagen uh, in Europe. And uh, my my story is, um, it, I mean, all these stories are some uh, often uh, somewhat similar. Um, when I was uh, uh, it's when I was around, I guess uh, twenty five, six, seven, something like that. I was uh, studying for my master's degree uh, in finance and accounting, and I was really going hard. I was really studying extremely intensively. I would I would show up to the library at eight o'clock in the morning and probably leave at uh, eight or ten uh, in the evening. And uh, I would uh, I would sit in not the best uh, position at my at my desk, 
And I would also um, pace myself to really um, take in the, the the material or the study, stu- uh, the, the material that, that we had to, to learn, partly because many of the exams we had, there was a very, very high failure percentage, like 60% on, on some of them. So you really had to put in an effort. But what happened to me when I had um, been on this master's program for about uh, one, two months, I think something like that. I noticed that in the evening, my head would start to hurt, you know, a classic uh, tension kind of headache, which, of course, uh, I would uh, dismiss and go back home and sleep and I will be fine the next the next morning. But eventually um, I noticed that the headaches that I had accumulated from the day before did not uh, resolve themselves in the morning. So instead of going to the doctor or instead of reflect, reflecting, I I just drank some more coffee and pushed through. And then around, so this was around, I started the, 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 um, the master's degree in, in September. And I think around probably December, beginning of December, things starting started to escalate very quickly downwards. So because I had this headache, um, I became anxious of not being able to follow uh, follow the, the curic- cur- curriculum or the, 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 the topics. And my sleeping started to get get worse and worse. And so I ended in this vicious spiral or vicious circle where um, my stress would get higher, my symptoms uh, would get higher, I would sleep, um, having have, have more and more difficulty sleeping. In fact, I would I would be extremely anxious about going to sleep uh, to the extent that my heart was pounding every time I had to, you know, at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock in the evening, I had to go to bed, because I was so afraid that I couldn't sleep. And lo and behold, of course, when you are so anxious about not being able to sleep. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy that made me unable to sleep, which just increased my anxiety for the next mor- morning or in the next evening, the day, the following day. So all of this uh, went downhill in, in a matter of a month, I think. And um, I had headaches, I had um, jaw pain, teeth pain, um, a strange pulling behind uh, the eye. I, I barely even remember all the s- symptoms that they are on the website, which I suppose we can share uh, afterwards. But um, it's www.curalistic.com org just for the record and then i just got feeling disturbances um, issues with my hands issues with my arms um, stuff went numb and yeah it's all kinds of strange things so i went to the doctors uh, i was um, sent uh, to all kinds of doctors i got an mr scan uh, x-ray all the conventional scans and the conclusion from the doctors was that essentially all the doctors knew what was wrong with me, but they just had a different explanation, all of them, which made me think that probably no one, none of them actually know what's wrong with me. So I took it upon me to to research the topic myself. Uh, I, I, I eventually got a book about trigger points, uh, was written uh, by a guy called Claire Davis, um, um, some, 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 I think 20, 20, 30 years back. And when I read this book, I instantly realized that this was this was my uh, this was what I was um, suffering from. His um, perspective of our focus is was purely on trigger points. I started experimenting, and uh, I su- I suddenly real I realized that stress was also a component of this um, um, condition. So I started massaging myself, which is the way to get rid of these muscular. Uh, so trigger points are mus- uh, small um, uh, muscular tension um, right where the nerve enters the muscles. Um, the, the the small muscle fibers get chronically cramped, and the purpose and and this is what produces all these symptoms. And the purpose of the of the uh, of the treatment is to press on the trigger points which will, over the course of uh, several months, will relax those small fibers and make the tr- trigger points go away. And your your symptoms will, will also uh, decrease slowly. So I managed to um, reduce my symptoms, but I had a lot, there was a lot of trial and error uh, because the trigger point instructions were very, uh, were quite crude in, in, the, in, the, in the book. And the purpose of the book wasn't really to recover you. It was more to explain about uh, trigger point massage. 
but it wasn't like a, a full, like a holistic, a complete instruction, also covering motivation and concerns and how to de-stress and what, why you got in this situation to begin with. So eventually I was um, pretty much recovered and I thought that surely I must cannot be the only one in the world uh, to suffer from some something like this. So I started um, researching and um, again, realized that actually a lot of people were suffering from 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 these kinds of symptoms and this kind of condition. By the way, I also uh, I, I forgot to mention that but before all of this went 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 wild, I actually had a snowboarding accident, uh, which caused uh, like a whiplash It was a few years before it sort of went away from uh, and, and and only to 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 increase during this um, stressful period. But then I just started um, helping people while I was working on the side. And eventually I took um, a, a year, I think, or so, where I invited some uh, some people who were suffering from these conditions to sp to live with me in an apartment uh i think i had the first the first um um first two people uh we, we we lived in an apartment for two months and they were basically doing the program that i had put together we were doing it full time which was four sessions per day where we massaged and did some breathing exercises and so on and each session was for about 2 hours so quite quite intensive simply because we had nothing else there was nothing else to do really the, the sole purpose of that was to to recover them as quickly as possible and i continued to do that with new uh, participants um only two two people at a time um which allowed me also to get to know these people quite intimately and sort of arrive at a what you could like um I got to know the kind of personality that these kinds of people, including myself, and it became more and more evident to me that stress was a central part of this. So stress and actually chest breathing um, are what I perceive to be the, the two, two uh, main sources uh, for this, this condition. Uh, because when you breathe with your chest, you are not using the diaphragm, the breathing muscle inside of your um, inside of your uh, belly. Instead, you're using all the neck muscles to pull up your rib cage, which puts tremendous stress on those muscles and make them very likely to develop uh, trigger points. I would like to just pause right here for a second, and I want to get into all of that—the the chest breathing. I also am very curious. You say a, a certain personality type. What would that personality type look like? There will be pr people who have a proclivity for chronic stress, and it sound it might sound a little bit um, controversial, but you know I include certainly include myself in this um, category. But anything, any kind of any kind of either personality traits or experiences that that might have put you in a chronic state a chronic st stress state so if so there's the entire trauma branch of why you might suffer from chronic stress but then there's also the uh, the personality traits and personality traits are things obviously there are things like you know um, genuine mental illness so things like um, anxiety uh, generalized anxiety disorder ocd and even more severe mental illnesses can can be uh, uh, can can pr produce uh, chronic stress but but also things like um, uh, being a people pleaser being a perfectionist having a very very high drive professionally you know perfectionism is is a great um, a trait usually but it can also be i mean every i'm sure that every successful person in the world was a perfectionist but, but the problem is that it comes with uh, a trade-off which is um, when you really have to perform highly your body will tend to get in in a in, in a in a height, heightened stress mode um, and if you do this enough, um, you are essentially living in, in, in kind of a chronic stress situation or, or, or yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I recently had a, um, a massage therapist working on me and, and as, as she was working on me, she turns around and she goes, do you happen to be very rigid in your ways? So, 
What, what makes you say that? She goes, yeah. are, you, are you closed off? I go, me? Closed off? What, what, what are you talking about? And then, and then like, when, um, when I, I got to see my, my wife, I said, she called me closed off. She goes, wow, she caught up on that. She caught that pretty yeah. quickly, huh? Yeah. And, yeah. And, I think, and, I, and I totally understand what you're saying. And I think that it is a very interesting dynamic because when, when I also read about your story and you know, the fact that you had that snowboarding accident and that a lot of people that you're working with tend to have that initial trauma that may be the the underlying cause, if you will, because I think back to, I grew up as an athlete. I was a wrestler, lacrosse player, football player, um, took multiple hits to the head, uh, some concussions. And, and although those things did not necessarily manifest themselves back then, I mean, maybe it was part of the cause of why I would so easily be triggered for a headache. It was interesting that after I felt as though I had recovered fully, strengthened my neck muscle, you know, gone seeing chiropractors, uh, make sure that I'm, I'm in proper alignment. You know, even with all of that, I still got these headaches later on. And it wasn't until I was hearing your story and the things you were teaching that I realized like, oh my gosh, I could pinpoint probably the accidents that I was in uh, between the ages of 17 and 22 that really are showing up now in the form of these headaches. And likely because as you're also alluding to now, my lifestyle with as respect to personality traits, uh, the way that I work and go about things. And I'm going to throw on top of that, even though I would, I'm a very skilled exerciser, if you will, skilled at lifting weights, there's, there's still a tremendous amount of stress that comes with that, that makes it hard for your body to recover. And from a musculoskeletal point of view, can also be a trigger for that stress. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, th there are phys physical traumas that will contribute to the, the situation. Uh, and then um, there are emotional traumas that might uh, contribute to, to, the, to the, the, um, uh, the condition. So my, my overarching hypothesis uh, and the way that I explain this, so typically you'll see people, um, so, so for example, you, you'll have uh, many of the, so I have a, a group on Facebook with where all these um, people who hear about me um, sign up and, and we discuss and we you know, help each other uh, to, to go through the, 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 the program. But um, about ha half of them ascribe their condition to a particular or maybe multiple events. So it might be, um, some people uh, might believe that, well, ascribe it to a car accident and they might have, might have received a diagnosis of a whiplash. Other people um, uh, ascribe it to when they hit their head and they might have received a diagnosis of a post-concussion syndrome. Other people um, ascribe it to having some, some dental work done, maybe um, pulling, pulling out of a wisdom tooth. Other people, again, ascribe it to uh, receiving, getting a vaccine. Other people ascribe it to um, a, an illness, uh, an infectious illness that they had, a, a severe one and so on. But the, the thing about the, the way that I, um, my hypothesis about why these events um, produce these symptoms is that a trigger point can exist in two states, either as a latent or inactive trigger point, which is characterized by not producing any symptoms. But but if you press it, you will still feel the referred tension. So um, many, just about every any people, any person, um, if you press on the top of their shoulder, like on on the classic massage area where people uh, like to massage uh, each other, most people will feel if you press hard enough, they will feel some sort of tension going up into the head, and that's that's an indication that they have latent. Uh, trigger points or inactive trigger points in those muscles, which of course is not a problem because you don't feel it uh, during the day. However, if your body and your muscles in particular 
come under a, 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 a an um, extreme uh, or urgent amount of stress, then those trigger points will switch from uh, latent or inactive to active. And this is what typically happens when people ascribe their condition to a particular event, um, such as a car accident, such as a fall, and so on. It is because they already had these latent trigger points building up maybe a little bit of this buildup was from the from a serious series of um, accidents but in particular most likely at least according to to, to my uh, view these uh, latent trigger points have been been building up due to stress and uh, chest breathing over the course of several years and then you just need a trigger and act, I call it the activating event which will, turn the trigger point from inactive to active. And the devious or the, the thing about trigger points is that when one trigger point turns active, it will send out pain to an area that is typically in, in, in the proximity of the trigger point. And those trigger points that have been latent in that area will then feel this stress because you might tense up even more and they will tend to switch from inactive to active. And this is also why um, people often experience a delayed effect from the activating event. It's not uncommon that people who have been in a car accident will only start to really experience the symptoms um, one or two weeks later. And that is because it one trigger point might have been activated during the, um, the car accident. And then it took some time for this um, trigger point to activate other uh, related or neighboring trigger points. And then a month later or two months later, you are in a full-blown situation where you have at least 20 or maybe 30 or maybe 40 strange symptoms that nobody can come up with an explanation for. What I find interesting, though, too, is... You know, again, in my personal experience, as well as, you know, some clients I work with, when I when I started going through some of these exercises and feeling relief, I had uh, about two other clients in particular who I knew were dealing with something similar. And all of us had a very similar story where, you know, we recognized that certain things would trigger our headache. I mean, maybe if you drank alcohol, that could be a trigger. If you were under a lot of stress, that was a trigger. We didn't know what the root cause was, it, you know, it, and I think that most people, I mean, you would probably agree, most people are walking around right now with these latent trigger points and sure. not even knowing it because there is no trigger. And then, you know, irregardless of an actual event, maybe you're far removed from that event, like I had been. I was far removed from any, you know, traumatic event, as well as I could say the same for these clients that I was working with. So was I, for the record. Something, yeah. yeah, exactly. And then something changed, right? Mm -hmm. Something something changed for you. It was being in the library, spending those hours studying. For them, I, I can't speak to them, but for me, it was where I am in my work career, maybe spending more time in a chair than I normally would in the past. But I just think what's really interesting is some people are listening to this going, well, I'm, I'm not dealing with any headaches. I'm not suffering from anything. But I, the thing that I want to point to is, again, the idea, though, that if you started feeling something, this is what it could be. And the reason why I say that is we start going on this search. Like I was going on a search for what are all the things that that cause this trigger. And one of the things that I landed on, which in some ways was very upsetting to me, and I know at least one of my clients had a similar experience. After doing some of our workouts, which is supposed to be one of the healthiest things that you could do for your body, I mean, you're strengthening it, you're preventing sarcopenia, you're putting yourself in a better physical state, suddenly we'd be experiencing this headache anywhere from one to two days afterwards. And it was this realization like, oh my gosh, should I not be working out? Should I not be exercising? But from doing the work that you had presented I've been able to go back to doing some of those exercises and doing some of those workouts without a, a challenge. And I bring it up for the simple fact that many people will put the blame on something where it doesn't actually belong. And what has been your experience with that? I mean, a lot of people are searching for answers and, you know, what have you seen in your 
conversations. For sure. Yeah, this is very, very interesting. And it's, it's interesting. So basically, when when you have these trigger points, whether they are active or latent or somewhere in between, and when you are in a state of chronic stress, you are essentially vulnerable to all kinds of effects from your environment. And obviously, you know, you can be vulnerable to any kind of exercise, uh, like um, um, strength training or just walking or running. But what is more uh, interesting is that you can be, uh, and this is more on the st- on the stress branch. So, so actually, just before I go into that, most of the of the people that 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 follow my program, they have, um, I'd say, like a 50-50 division of symptoms where ha- yeah, fifty percent of the symptoms can be ascribed to the trigger points. And the other 50% of the symptoms can be ascribed to the chronic stress uh, state that they are in. And one of those very familiar or common areas of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of symptoms relates to, the, to your digestion and, uh, and your gut. So some people will, real, will, will notice that they feel better or they feel better or their, their digestion works better when they eat a certain kind of food. So they will tend to um, eat, let's say they'll stay away from, I'm just, it, it differs from pe- person to person, but let's just say that 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 they um, uh, that they do poorly with meats and uh, carbohydrates or pasta, for example. So they will try to treat their gut, uh, their gut health by not eating all those different kinds of food where the real true recovery or approach would be to get your your body out of the out of out of chronic stress so that your body can cope with um with these different kinds of foods because what stress is and this is something I'm 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 quite excited about people don't really understand the evolutionary purpose of stress like um well i yeah w- what is what is stress and why does it seem that we can in- exist is it okay that i talk about stress a little bit yeah please i i think it's a, it's a topic that we often do discuss and yeah. obviously the role of cortisol and how how our body again has these stress responses and the cascading effect yet you know sh- stress is also there to protect us and i exactly. think that's that's part of exactly. the challenge so yeah please go exactly so so stress really is um you have your body is composed of what you could say, uh, or you, your, your body going back to when you were, we were a bacteria or a fish or, you know, whatever we were, we basically, basically had two kinds of threats to our, to our survival. We had long-term survival and we had short-term survival threats. Short-term survival threats, are stuff like, um, being eaten by a predator. That would be short-term survival. And the long-term survival pressure or threats would be things like um, getting sick or not having enough to eat and so on. So your body has has had to um, deal with threats that would um, come in the long-term and might, uh, might cause you to die. Or threats that could cause you to die in the short term, like in the next five minutes. So the problem for an organism is that we, back in the back in the time, or you know, up until a hundred years ago, people and animals essentially died because they don't, didn't have enough food to eat. That was the number one reason uh, people died. So at any any given point, your your body only had a certain amount of calories that it could use to, you know, do whatever it felt what would be the best use of these calories. And um, obviously, when you are when you are chased by a tiger, you have um, you need to get away from that tiger, which means that all the calories and oxygen, for that matter, you have available in your body needs to go into the purpose of escaping from that tiger. And there's really only one function of your body that um, contributes to you escaping the tiger and that's your muscles your digestion 
in those next five minutes does not contribute. Your ability to procreate, I guess, does not contribute. Um, your ability to grow hair does not contribute. Your immune system does not contribute. Um, your ability to think complex thoughts does not contribute and so on. So given that you only have a few, um, a limited amount of calories available in the next five minutes within your body, you need to put all of those calories into um, running away from the tiger, which means that all the attention goes to your, your muscles. They will tense up. All of your other long-term survival systems will be put on pause so that they don't consume any calories. And you then get those five minutes to run away run away from the tiger or fight it. Um, and as soon as you're done with that, you're supposed, your body is supposed to uh, switch back to the long-term survival by reallocating all of those calories and the oxygen back to all of your long-term survival systems and then lower the tension and the um, excitement of your muscles. However, when people are chronically stressed, they stay in this uh, mode where all of the calories, all of the attention goes to the muscles, which means makes the muscles very tense, and they deplete the attention from all the other systems of the body. So digestion, the hormonal system, the immune system, and so on. And this is why when you are in this chronic uh, stress state, your body starts to malfunction in all kinds of way, ways. So when you, when you mentioned this thing about, um, you know, where you, your exercise and all that stuff, it's really because um, if you are in a chronically state, uh, chronically stressed state, then you are vulnerable for, uh, for all kinds of external stimuli that would otherwise that your body would otherwise be perfectly capable of dealing with because it is not yeah. it's so interesting i mean i i hear what you're saying you're, you're basically exacerbating the problem because you have not addressed the root cause of your problem yes. that that being these these trigger points and of course you know i completely concur with what you're saying with regards to stress here we are in this chronic chronic state of stress all the time. And, you know, what does that do to our body? Well, it, it keeps our body very tense right from maybe the moment we wake up and our phone is going off or we're, you know, checking this little device. And now we're maintaining that state all throughout the day. Yeah. We would add on top of that beyond just what it's doing to you from a, a, a musculoskeletal standpoint and, and how that might be affecting your nerves. You know, we speak a lot from a nutritional standpoint of if you are always in this state of chronic stress, well, that means you have these chronically elevated blood glucose and insulin levels as a response. Because mm -hmm. when you are in that state of acute stress, like you said, being attacked by the tiger, you know, in that instance, we get that rise in cortisol, which is supposed to help us produce more glucose, which that gets shuttled to the muscles and allows us to, as you said, either fight or flight. But if we're constantly in that state, then your body never gets a chance to allow those levels to come down. And I think this ties very nicely, though, into the other piece of the conversation, which is uh, that of being able to relax, being able to breathe, being able to put yourself in a relaxed state so that you can not necessarily be triggered by these trigger points. Yeah, for sure. So it's definitely all about getting out of stress, um, this chronic stress state. If you want to uh, fix those of your symptoms that are, uh, that are um, caused by your body being in, in chronic stress, so putting all of the attention into the muscles and basically having paused uh, or put, put all the other long-term survival systems on pause, then you need to calm down. You need to get out of stress. Do that. How do yeah. we do that? Like, so how walk, do you do walk, me through the, walk us through the exercise of how do we get ourselves out of that? Because I listen, 
before jumping on here, I told you I was going to be five minutes late because I've been doing nothing but meetings mm -hmm. since, you know, eight o'clock this morning, Eastern time. Here we are, you know, we started at, at one o'clock and it had been nonstop, go, 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 go. I still have not gotten a chance to catch my breath. So yeah. walk me through how I would do that. Sure. So in, in my opinion, the most important uh, element of getting out of chronic stress is the breathing. There is this very, very strange, peculiar relationship between stress and the way that you breathe. And it goes like this. If you force yourself to breathe with your belly, then your body will, for one reason or another, I don't know why, but it's 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 a fact of the matter that if you breathe with your belly, which means you push your belly out when you inhale and uh, and let go, then the stress of your body will com come down. Reversely, if you force yourself to breathe with your chest, then you can actually increase this the the the, the level of stress in your body. So that's very interesting, but it, the, the the story doesn't stop there because there's a, there's like a double feedback because so when you breathe with your belly, your stress will come down. But the fact that your stress comes down will make you even more likely to breathe with your belly. So there's this positive feedback between breathing with your belly and lowering stress. So if you're very, very anxious, if you force yourself to breathe with your belly, you'll be sending us, it might be uncomfortable to breathe with your belly, in fact, when you're stressed, because your body doesn't want to breathe with the belly, it wants to breathe with the chest. But if you force yourself to breathe with the belly, you, you, will, you will essentially be forcing your body to calm down, and your body will be even more likely to want to breathe with the belly, which makes it easier and you can maintain the belly breathing, which will lower your stress, which will send a signal back to your belly to breathe more with the belly. Reversely, if you're breathing with your chest, you will you will increase your stress and the body will, because you're increasing your stress, your body will say, hey, let's breathe even more with our chest. And this is typically when, if you if you get caught in this spiral, you, 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 you get stuck in hyperventilation, where you get so completely um, overwhelmed with anxiety and stress, which feeds into your chest breathing, which feeds into your stress, and it just goes berserk, essentially. Um, so the, the, the thing is that many people um, and uh, are accustomed to breathing with the chest. And I have my own little uh, theory about this. And I think there's the stress component, because if you're chronically stressed, you it, it will keep you, maintain you in a chest breathing state. But there's another um, element, and that is uh, what I th think that in, in order to not have a belly that sticks out, people will want to pull it in. And if you statically have your belly pulled in and you, you're just more like your breath needs to go somewhere. So you'll pull in and tense up your belly and um, and you will end up breathing with your chest. So I think that, um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but I, I probably like 80%, 90% of people who fall into this category are women, not in the breathing, but the people in my group, for example, it's, it's, and all these diagnoses like fibromyalgia, post concussion, uh, whiplash, TMJ, eustachian uh, you, you st you tube dysfunction, Meniere's disease, and so on and so on. They are overwhelmingly dominated by, by, by women. And one of the my hypotheses as to why that might be the case is because uh, women are. Um, you know, there are more um, demands put on the way that they look, especially when they're young. So my hypothesis is that many uh, young girls will pull in their belly when they, you know, are like 12, 12, 13, 14 years old and become self-aware. And this will make them breathe with their chest, which will increase their stress 
and which will uh, um, tense up those uh, neck muscles in the uh, that 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 form these trigger points and and produce all of those symptoms. So to get back to your question, how do we do it? We start. Uh, we we need to start breathing with our belly. That's one thing. The other. So that's one branch you could say that then you can also uh, get into meditation and you can combine the the breathing with meditation you can do sit down actual breathing exercises but ideally we would want you to start breathing with your belly as a habit that where you don't think about it but where it just happens uh, and for the record you can keep you can main- maintain a flat stomach and breathe with your belly at the same time so those two do not rule each other out you just need to know why or uh, how but the other brain which is falls outside of my um, area, so to speak, but that is um, some sort of therapy, which could be like you need to go and 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 have some some traditional therapy or read some self help books that that might help you come to terms with uh, whatever. Um, whatever mental situation uh, might be causing uh, uh, causing you your stress or situational um, situation that might be causing you your chronic stress. No, that's great. And I think the, the thing to highlight here is, you know, belly breathing does not come naturally to most of us. We've probably, you know, have been, as you alluded to, breathing with our chest, probably the majority of our life. It's probably maybe since we've been a baby that we yeah. naturally breathe with our belly. And so the, the first part of this is making yourself aware that you actually need to do this because unless you make yourself aware and conscious that you're not breathing with your belly and that you need to, you're never going to arrive the place, like you said, positive feedback loop where it is happening, happening naturally. And listen, I honestly could put myself in the category of like the 12, 13, 14 year old girls since, you know, I, I grew up a, a bodybuilder and, and the whole focus had always been on maintaining the tightest midsection possible. And especially, you know, you as soon as a shirt comes off, be it at the beach, the pool or a bodybuilding stage, you know, that is the focal point. But I just find it so interesting because I see in you talking about this, all these little elements that have have built up to cause me to have this occipital neuralgia. And, and all this time I had been searching for one particular cause and factoring as many things out as I could. I was able to factor out the nutrition. I mean, I'm full-blown carnivore. It doesn't get more anti-inflammatory than that. So I was able to, to wipe out that as a cause. You know, I get deep into prayer every morning. So I, I'm starting my day typically in a very low stress environment and frame of mind, but then seeking all the other little things that are happening that may be causing the initial trigger. But now I'm just seeing a, such a bigger picture from you talking of, of all the things though that have led to this. Um, what I would love to do now though, is we haven't spoken too much yet about how to go about addressing these trigger points. And you have, first, I'm gonna encourage everybody to go on YouTube to see your videos that you have on your Curalistic channel on YouTube. I've found them to be highly valuable. I'll tell you, I started off ones where I was just doing the self-massage and I was working just right around the uh, sternoclomastoid. And it's amazing to me that when I first started doing it, I mean, I couldn't grab anything. Like I had nothing to grab onto. It was just straight tension. And and now, I mean, I'm able to, to grab hold and separate the muscles quite easily. But I recognize that even though that started working and I was doing really well, it still wasn't the thing yet. And that's when... I happened upon your video with using the uh, the, the back knobber, which I very quickly in, invested the forty dollars in in this tool, and this has made probably the biggest difference in terms of addressing where those trigger points are. Because I'm thinking the whole time, all my trigger points are in my neck. They're in my neck, not realizing, like you said before, they're only in my neck because they're being triggered by my trapezius. And and now that I've been addressing that, I don't even feel as though I need to address my neck. So I know that was a lot, but I would just love for you to to walk people through this. 
Yeah, sure. So the I, I mentioned earlier that I I I what really got me started on this was uh, getting a book. And I think it's called The Trigger Point Workbook by Claire, Claire Davis. And it's a great starting point. But the way that that book is built up is that it, it essentially just lists all the muscles in the body. And then it talks about some symptoms that could be caused by trigger points in this, in this muscle. Uh, and I don't know, do we have like 600 muscles, something, at least a, a lot of muscles in, yeah. in the body. And for somebody who's starting out um, with this, it's completely overwhelming because essentially any muscle pretty much in your upper body can produce any symptom in your upper body. It's a great place to start, but it's also overwhelming in the sense of what sh where should I put my effort? What, what should I start with? And how can I like put together some habits and a program uh, that makes it not only efficient, but also easy to follow? Most of the people who deal with um, symptoms in the head regardless of what the symptom is. The most frequently um, uh, muscle to blame for this is, as, as you mentioned before, uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, um, which sits on the side of your neck. It, it, um, it, um, it attaches uh, on your skull behind your ear and then uh, on, on your, uh, just in front of your neck, on, on your collarbone and on, on, on your chest bone. I'm sure people can, can Google where, where it sits. But this, this muscle is probably responsible for something like between 30 and 40% of the symptoms in the, in the head. And then we have the other uh, main culprit um, in terms of symptoms in the head, which is the trapezius muscle. And the trapezius muscle is a rather big muscle that stretches um, quite a large area. The trapezius um, it, yeah, it goes from, from the top of your, your middle of your neck and then uh, spreads out across your, your shoulders and then down uh, between your shoulder blades. And the most important part of your trapezius to treat when it comes to symptoms in the head would be right on top of the shoulder, on the shoulders. So that big, thick roll of muscle right on top of the of the shoulders, which the back knob is, is, is brilliant at, at attacking. So my recommendation um, is before you go into um, a complete um, analytical mode where you consider all of your muscles, just make sure that you have cleaned out the SCM muscle, the, the sternocleidomastoid, and the top part of your trapezius on, on top of your of your shoulders the goal is to clean out completely those two areas from trigger points that will take your all the symptoms in your head um, it will re reduce it by about uh, about 60 to 80 percent something like that which is a huge gain for uh, any any person suffering from um, any of these symptoms. And it's very, very straightforward. The way to actually treat these trigger points, if you would like me to um, go there. Yeah, yeah please, please yeah. do. So, so a trigger point needs to be, um, according to the literature, um, there have been studies and back in the 60s, there were some more, um, more serious um, research being done uh, around how to treat trigger points and people did um, trial and errors of the most efficient way to, to do them. And one of the ways you can treat trigger points is by self-applied massage. And um, there are a few um, uh, variations of how you can apply uh, do this uh, massage. But my recommendation is one in which you apply a static pressure on the trigger point. You can also do what they call a milking, um, a milking, um, a more traditional massage. Either one of those um, um, uh, approaches should be okay. However, the static pressure um, approach is, in my opinion, much easier. Uh, because one of the difficulties of treating trigger points is that once you find the trigger point, it sort of has a tendency to slip out between uh, your fingers, like when you're trying to stab or to to um, uh, yet yeah, to to pinch a, a, a pea with a fork. Like it, every time you want to um, pierce it, it, it it slips out. It's better, in my opinion, to use a static pressure because once you've caught that trigger point, you you, you don't want to let go. 
and you apply a pressure and there are different ways of, 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 of determining how hard you should press. But my general rule is that you should press at a pain level of hurting good. So the pain that you experience when you press the trigger point should be that one of those kind of like, oh, that hurts, but that feels really good kind of pains. One reason for that is that it's, it appears to be the, mo- the, the, the perfect amount of pain. And also because when it feels good, you're, you're, you're going to want to do it more. Um, so there's a motivational aspect in not pressing as hard as you can tolerate, but pressing as hard until as, as it so so that it feels good. According to the literature, you should and and also the, these are my recommendations. You should uh, uh, maintain the pressure for about a minute or so. Once you get further down the 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 path, you can maintain the pressure for way longer, ten minutes, or on and and basically you can maintain it for as long as it feels right you'll develop like an intuitive sense of when the trigger point has gotten enough and you can just press it for as long. But in the beginning, around one minute, the trigger points that you're looking for are um, characterized. So when you grab your muscle, how do you know you're pressing a trigger point? The most important thing you're going for is tenderness when you press it. And that tenderness might be felt in the muscle itself where you press, or it might be felt as a referred sensation or pain to another place, but it doesn't have to. Another indication of a trigger point is if it's typically the trigger point is typically found um, or um, characterized or experienced or felt like a nodule, or it can be um, uh, placed inside a hard part of your muscle, but it can also be more like a hard kind of string. That feels like a string. But if you have all these um, um, indicators, my the best the best indication is really where does it hurt the most when you press. So that's typically where you would want to press. Do you, do you know you have it when you press? You are feeling it in the area that you typically experience the headache. Would mm-hmm. that be would that be a fair way of assessing whether or not you have it properly somewhere in that area? Absolutely. If you're feeling the re- the referred pain, or I'm I'm not tar- I'm not I'm I've, I'm going away from calling it referred pain, but rather I like to call it referred sensation because some of the sensations can be tingling or uh, like a, a sensation of uh, of uh, of tension or of of like a b- balloon blowing up or like being being inflated inside your head. Uh, so you feel the referred sensations. And if those sensations are replicating the actual symptoms that you experience on a daily basis, then that's perfect. Then that's definitely. So the referred pain, if you're feeling that or referred sensations, then you're definitely on the right track. Then it's just a question of can you move your can you move your fingers or back knobber like a, a, a quarter of an inch or a few millimeters to in any direction to experience even more of this. And when you found the spot that produces the most amount of referred sensation or pain, then you are essentially right on top of the trigger point. Um, and then, um, so, and then you, you would need to apply this massage um, eight to 12 times per day. The idea that, that, that you can get somebody else to apply this massage to you. But having somebody else apply the massage is going to be um, suboptimal for two reasons. Firstly, the person who is pressing your trigger points cannot feel this referred sensation or pain that you can feel. And this is essentially the most important guiding tool to knowing that you are right on top of the trigger point. And as I just explained, sometimes you just need to move your fingers a millimeter to the left, right, up or down in order to get right on top of the trigger point. And an external practitioner, unless they are extremely skilled or have telepathic abilities, uh, are unable to get this micro calibration um, exactly right in the same way that you can. The other reason that you cannot rely or shouldn't rely on, on somebody else to do it is because you need to do this eight to 12 times per day or essentially continuously throughout the day. 
and nobody can afford it. And it's just impractic impractical to have um, a massage therapist or somebody else uh, perform this massage on you 12 times per day. So this is why I say the patient must become the the doctor or the practitioner. So you need to put in a little bit of effort to learn how to do this yourself so that you can um, keep this, so that you can treat yourself, recover yourself, and keep this skill with you for the rest of your life. I'm so happy that you brought that up because I could see how easy it would be for somebody listening to this to say, well, I'll just go get a massage. And me being one of those people that did go and get massages, maybe not regularly, but anytime I would get one, the, the massage therapist, the masseuse would notate how tense I would be and how tight. And like you said, there's no way or nor is it practical from both a, a financial and a time standpoint to go and see that masseuse five days a week. Exactly. You know, that's not going Even to happen. Five, day, five times a day. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, what, what I do like about this and you made a good point of it is, you know, you, the patient becomes the practitioner and nobody knows you better than you. And if you're a person out there who's listening or watching this right now, and you know this is resonating with you and you're saying, yeah, I think this might be the missing link for me. I think this could be the underlying cause of the headaches that I've been experiencing. Well, it's important that you, you start applying this to yourself, that you cannot rely upon others. This is nothing that you could pass off. And admittingly, it, for me, it was being at that place where I was willing to try anything. I had spoken to people about Botox. I had, uh, even though I did not go and get an MRI, I had those set up. They were on the calendar, ready to go and have that done. And it was almost like, I will try anything. And it was probably about three or four different YouTube videos before I landed on yours. And what was the common uh, message that I kept hearing was around tension and massage and treating this area. And I'm thinking like, it can't be that simple because here I am every six to eight days having to take Excedrin, having to take Advil, whatever I could get my hands on to just dull the pain. Because at that point it wasn't getting rid of it. And here I am as a father, a multi-business owner, needing to produce and literally I'm, I'd be knocked off of my game for two days because of this. And it was upsetting because with all my study around nutrition and how much as, as a practitioner myself, I promote gut health, knowing that I had to rely upon these NSAIDs to try to treat an issue and knowing what that's doing to my gut health. So it was, I think a lot of us have to reach that point where we feel we are at rock bottom in order to actually start seeking out what are the, the potential ways that I could remedy this situation. But you have to understand that you're the one who has to take the reins, that you cannot rely on other people to do this for you. I, as much as I love when my, my wife gives me a massage or I ask one of my boys, hey, you mind you know, rubbing dad's back? They're not gonna hit those points as well as I do when I take out the back knobber and then to supplement that with those types of massages or going to see a masseuse, I think is outstanding, but we really do need to treat this as our own journey. And we, we need to take the steps ourselves to figure out how can I treat this myself? And it's very empowering when you do. Yeah, I turned your video on to those couple clients that I had mentioned early on. And one of them within one week, she was like, this is what I've been looking for forever. My headaches are gone. And she was a person every time she came into our training studio, and we still do it anyway, because it's good for her. We would make sure that she would do some form of neck exercise to actually fatigue those muscles so that she couldn't overly tense them when doing the actual workout. And, and I myself still do that some from time to time. If I know that I'm in a state in which I might be a little overstressed and that it would be very easy for me to overly tense the neck, doing some form of lighter neck exercises to pre-fatigue those muscles could be beneficial. But 
the whole point being that it's it's a personal journey and and we have to be willing to go out and learn and you know i'm just very appreciative that you took the steps that that you did and you know have then brought this forward to to others and i would love to just finish this up right now with you talking a little bit more about this project that you have and I believe from what we heard earlier, it started your in your apartment with a, a couple willing people who wanted who would give any anything a try themselves, and now has progressed from there. So you know, tell us a little bit about that. When I realized that I could um, solve this or recover from this, I I initially diagnosed myself because I, I sort of had had to like grab onto some kind of diagnosis. And the one that I grabbed onto was whiplash because um, that was from my snowboard accident. So my, the, the way that I initially approached this, and once I, once I was able to recover myself, I just got excited. I love solving problems. Yeah, I just love solving problems. So I'm, I just get excited when, 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 and it doesn't really matter what kind of problem it is. Um, it just so happened to be that there was a big problem in 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 this uh, in in this area that I could um, you know throw my attention on. So I just got excited about um, finding other people with a diagnosis of whiplash, and then I got in touch with those people, and those people um, were actually there was a particular offering in Denmark where where I lived. Um, where people would come in every day, um, and I think like 40 people, this had nothing to do with me, but these were people with whiplash, but also with post-concussion syndrome and a few other diagnoses. And it turned out to my surprise that, okay, it's it's not just about whiplash. There are actually other kinds of diagnoses, post-concussion and yeah, um, so, some other uh, diagnoses that also seem to have the same pattern of uh, symptoms. So I expa- expanded my, my scope and started looking for these kinds these of kinds people of- uh, as well with, with those diagnoses. Eventually, at, at some point, I, I started the Facebook group uh, where um, it started, I guess it started, I suppose it started with um, f- um, whiplash p- uh, patients and post-concussion and, and fibromyalgia those were sort of the main diagnosis that that uh, that that I focused on, or at least that, that I communicated outwards were that this group was for. But all of a sudden, people starting signing up from all kinds of other groups. Some, there's something called eustachian Eusta- tube dysfunction, and they would because when when people sign up to my group, I ask them how did they hear about this. Um, um, uh, my group. Then they will write, oh, somebody in this eustachian tube dysfunction group uh, mentioned that they had uh, gotten a lot of relief. Then I'm like, well, what's what's eustachian tube dysfunction? And then I started researching that and I realized that 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 was also also fell within this di- uh, this trigger point stress um, paradigm that I was working with, and I p- could probably um, write down maybe a hundred different diagno- diagnoses right now, all kinds of strange um, syndromes that relate to um, malfunctioning eyes, eyes that will not um, eyes where one eye will be chronically cross-eyed, eyes that cannot focus eyes that uh, go go blind in the dark or cannot uh, um, adjust to the light, all kinds of ear dysfunctions. And all of these different um, um, uh, symptoms that I mentioned here have different di- diagnoses attached to them. So if you go to the, your eye doctor, you'll get some, some random um, name attached to the symptoms that you that you um, um, come up with. By the way, the common denominator for all of these diagnoses is if you Google and you get a, go into WebMed or something like that, it always says cause unknown, always. So that's the, the common denominator. And it's uh, it's just a wide variety of different diagnoses. In fact, um, I think in, in Denmark, at least um, one in five visits to the doctor is related to uh, uh, one of these uh, conditions that fall within this umbrella. And if I'm not um, uh, mistaken, it has been calculated that the US is spending uh, twice as much money um, on these kinds of um, conditions 
than on cancer than, than on cancer. It's called like functional. Um, you know, you can find all kinds of um, spectacular um, statistics. Um, something like five percent of of the population of the U.S. Um, so, um, have a diagnosis or suffer from similar symptoms uh, of fibromyalgia, and I don't know, fifteen percent have a diagnosis of of trans uh, or TMJ disorder, where where your uh, jaw is is malfunctioning. So it's really, really, really widespread. So my project right now is essentially is to to get this uh, this out to as many people as possible. I've written a, a small book, which I encourage people to write it, uh, read. It's it's free, and it's part of the program that I have put together, which is also available on my website. So everything that I'm doing is, is free. I have also written a larger, longer book, which has not been published, but it's going to come out eventually um, because I have my full-time work uh, um, on the side. My main goal is to to get this out to as many people as possible. And I have all kinds of uh, awesome things planned for the future, such as, uh, you know, a study. I'd like love to do a study with some um, objective um, um, scientists, I, I guess, researchers who can follow um, and, and make a proper study on, on these, uh, these um, techniques and, and um, hopefully, well, I know that it will happen, but proof that uh, at least from a, a, a scientific point of view, this actually does work and this does actually predictably recover people uh, from all these kinds of diff different kinds of uh, um, uh, problems. And then I want to start um, some, um, some retreat centers around the world where people can go for like a, a boot camp of maybe one, two or three months and really put in a, a, a concentrated effort. I think I'm going to stop stop this uh, work when, when I leave this world, hopefully in many, many years and just push it as far as I can. Well, we're going to be sure to link to all of your, your resources in our show notes and everything below. And uh, I just want to say, I mean, again, I am so grateful that you were the one who decided to take what you've learned and to, you know, put it out there for others to absorb and to put into practice. And I just love the way that you're going about this. I mean, it's, it's very authentic. It's very sincere. Obviously you are passionate about this, passionate about helping people. And, uh, you know, I couldn't be more appreciative of that. And I know our audiences too. And I, to be quite frank, I knew that this was a departure from the things that we would normally talk about on this podcast. But my feeling was if if this reached just one person, just one ear that took this information, applied it, and, and it suddenly changed their life because we know what it's like to live with those types of debilitating headaches, um, it would be worth it. It would totally be worth it because it's been... It's been that way for me. Um, the few people that I've been able to share it with, to see it impact them. And I just want to let you know that you're doing great work and that uh, there are, I know there's many people who have written their testimonials about you know the work they've done with you and how it's helped them. But I just wanted to be a, a, another one added to that list. And I thank you, appreciate you and uh, look forward to helping you to promote this further. Yeah, thanks for having me on the podcast. My pleasure, Gustav. All right, guys. Well, you know what to do. Go check out those show notes. Please click on those links and most definitely share this with someone else who you know is suffering with headaches of any sort. Because I know that as a headache sufferer, a longtime headache sufferer, I mean, we are constantly, we are all constantly on the search for what the root cause could be. And oftentimes we don't know what it is. And this just might be it for somebody that you know. So that said, hope you guys have a great one and we will catch you on the next episode.